Well, hello there, everyone. Welcome to Sama Saturday. This is our monthly show on Sama Dog, where we come together to discuss holistic wellness for our animal friends. And of course, a lot of this applies to our human friends as well. It's wonderful to be back together here with all of you. My name is Amanda Ree. I'm the founder of Sama Dog, and I am here with Dr. Katie Kangas, our amazing co-host. Hello, Dr. K. Hello, glad to be here with you. Yes, me too. It's been a little while and we're really happy to see and connect with all of you again. Thank you for sending in some of your great questions. We will be getting to that because today our topic on Sama Saturday, each time it's a little different. Today we decided to go with the topic of Ask the Vet Anything. So an open Q&A with Dr. Kangas and just allow her to be tapped for the wealth of wisdom that she is and she can help and guide you and give you some inspiration, some tips and tools to help your animals at home starting today. So that's very exciting. I think most of you know Dr. Kangas. She's been with us for several years now, but she is the co-host of Sama Saturday, as I mentioned. She has been a veterinarian for over 25 years, 15 years focused in the integrative veterinary world. Can you believe it? <laughs> and she is the owner of a thriving uh, veterinary office called Integrative Veterinary Care in San Diego, California, intvetcare.com. I'll put that up a little bit later as well. And Dr. Kangas really specializes in on food as medicine. You know, she can speak to a wealth of, of topics, but that really is where she's honed her specialty and she has become one of the experts in the world on that topic. So we're really lucky to have her with us. Thank you you for being thank, here always. Thank you for the opportunity to contribute to such wonderful discussions. Really, really appreciate being here. Uh, awesome. Yeah, well, we're very grateful and we're grateful for all of you listeners and participants. You know, we're always hearing stories back from you about how you're caring for your animals and nothing could make us happier. Do let us know that you're here. Oh, thank you, Jana Marie. I did get some bangs. You know, I'm trying out a new hairdo. You got to got to make it work when you let the gray grow you get creative right so <laughs> thank you and um and my brother's here too hi rob and we would love to hear from all of you who's who's on the line right now where are you watching from and who are you with your little fur friends or your human friends and of course if you have any questions go ahead and type them into the comments uh, now we'll just turn it over to Dr. Kangas first, see if there's anything that you'd like to throw in here, Dr. K, and kind of get us started, and then we'll start into our questions. Um, geez, I just want to thank everybody for the interest that you have in sharing such good, you know, health for your pets and, and providing them with exceptional care. The intention that you have in doing this really, really is what I'm all about supporting. So I'm just happy to be here to support everybody to, to do that. And it's uh, so rewarding for me as always that as people learn about how to care for their pets with better health, as Amanda uh, said earlier, it all applies to us as well. So it's just such a wonderful forum for us all to learn so much that we can apply around the whole family, so. Mm -hmm. I know when we, when Dr. Kangas and I hang out, uh, we can't stop. Like it's just one thing after another, you know, of all the different, um, whether it's supplements or ways of looking at things or um, things that we've learned and, you know, have recently come out in studies. And so it is uh, very genuine, you know, what comes from us to you. We really try to live and breathe this and just love to be able to expand the conversation to our whole community. Yep. So as I mentioned, throw your questions in here. Let us know where you're watching from and who you're with. And we will, I've got um, some of your questions that you sent in on the posts prior. So we'll just go ahead and jump into some of those now. So let's start off with this question. It is best ways to get older dogs to eat more. This is um, from Cynthia. I know that this is about her dog, Tori. She's getting an older service dog. And so she says, she's asking that, and what are some ideal high calorie foods? Ah, awesome, awesome questions. And I will tell you, that I have seen a general trend in many years of veterinary practice that older pets tend to, you know, very geriatric or pets maybe with chronic illness and they're just a, you know, a little weaker than, you know, the high vibrance vitality of a younger or a very healthy pet that I see them starting to be resistant to putting their head into a deeper ditch. So believe it or not, there are a lot of older dogs that will eat so much better on a flat surface. So if you feed them on a plate, 
And a lot of people will tell me, hey, if I feed them out of my hand, they'll eat. But if I put the food in the dish, they won't. And oftentimes you can just put the food on a flat surface or a plate and they will eat it off of that. So just the mechanics of that may be one big thing. Uh, another thing too is elevating the dish a little bit if it's a you know taller dog just so they don't have to bend over quite so much. We want it to be lower than your shoulders. You don't want to be you know having a dish up to their chin as they're standing. That's not good for them either, and not good for the mechanics of them swallowing. But something that's lower than their shoulders but still raised up a little bit also might make a big difference. So those are just mechanics of of what might promote an older dog to eat better, and then things that you can do to add vitality to them so that they want to eat is obviously through food medicine, giving them you know, numerous foods that offer great nutrient density to the body, great vitality and energy, and that promotes a better appetite. So a lot of the foods that I often recommend, and of course we've talked about in many of our sessions here, the medicinal foods like raw dairy, fermented foods, um, sardines, free range eggs, you know, those kinds of things, bone broth, those will all add to vitality and they are so flavorful. One of the things that I would love to make a specific mention about raw dairy is that kefir or milk, <clears throat> excuse me, goat milk or cow kefir is, is uh, very common things that we give to our dogs. And any, <clears throat> excuse me, any raw milk is considered a very complete food. It's, in fact, it's been dubbed the most complete food on the planet. So when your dog drinks raw milk, they are getting every single nutrient the body needs. Every protein, every amino acid, every enzyme, every cofactor, every nutrient that the body needs exists in that. So it is a liquid nutrient dense meal that is incredibly easy to digest. Okay, very, very easy for the tissues to assimilate those nutrients uh, and you know utilize them. So that is such a great food to add in for an aging pet. As long as it agrees with their digestion, 100% of dogs are not going to do great with raw milk or certainly right off the bat. So if you're just starting it, use your judgment and start with you know slow increasing volumes but um, that is such an incredible food for older pets. One more comment I can make is that I really like to put older pets on a vitamin B12 supplement. That is fantastically uh, beneficial. As we age, humans too, and pets, uh, and or if there's any digestive issues, we start to have less ability to absorb our vitamin Bs and notably vitamin B12 and many people who have had B12 injections know that they feel so much more vitality and energy and even mental clarity and feel better. I have seen so many pets dramatically turn around with just vitamin B12 on board. So that is a wonderful supplement to do. There are some easy ones that are obviously already made for pets. I really like the Amino B Plex. I think I might have a little visual if I can find it quick enough. Um, Yes, just so people can see what I'm talking about. Oops, that's a product that I really like to use, the Amino B Plex from RX Vitamins. And then many of you know, I really love the Animal Essentials Company. So Animal Essentials also makes a B complex for dogs and cats and animals. So that is a wonderful thing to do for seniors or older pets. It will really elevate their full body vitality, their appetite, it's a, somewhat of a natural appetite stimulant. Um, and vitamin B12 literally helps the cells to create more energy for not only feeling good, but for repairing tissues and you know keeping the organs functioning and everything going better. So that would be my top tips for the older older pets. Mm -hmm. Well, those are great tips, Dr. Hingis. Thank you very much. You bet. Some of those we just don't even think of, like the plate, the flat plate. You know, I, I right off the bat, you're giving us things that, you know, just most of us don't aren't aware of. And like you said, sometimes just trying to hand feed will work out. Why is that? And yeah. so just kind of putting that together for us. I know my dog who passed away last year, she I always thought had a trauma with bowls, actually, and, and things of that nature because of the place that she came from. So we would put it on like a lunchroom um, tray, like just those thick plastic one, you know, yeah. that you put with lunchrooms and then it's easily washable and and whatnot so that was very helpful and she liked it yep um we have one question that came in in regard to what you were speaking about wouldn't that be more true of dog milk for dogs and goat milk for goats rather than goat milk for dogs 
Uh, yeah, interesting. So it is, it actually still is a complete meal. And obviously it sounds, you know, very intuitively reasonable that you would want to consume the milk from your own species. But bovine milk and goat milk have been used for centuries in very healthy cultures that, you know, clearly humans can do very well on these things if they are raw. That is where the big, you know, distinction needs to be made is that modern day dairy has gotten a bad rap because modern day dairy is pasteurized in most you know places most cultures today as soon as milk is heated or pasteurized those nutrients get very altered then it becomes hard to digest people are lactose intolerant because the lactase in the milk isn't there to help you digest it it's mucus producing it's got all these you know so i always tell people pasteurized dairy is empty calories that's allergenic raw dairy is very medicinal and interestingly, yes, dogs and humans, as long as it's raw, get exceptional nutrient density from you know these these um, foods. And as a, as an interesting side note that might just make a little bit of sense in this context is that something I learned about colostrum recently. And colostrum, if you get that for your pet, is generally or yourself is going to show up in the form of a powdered bovine colostrum. Okay, bovine being cow. Colostrum is the term that's given to the very first milk that comes out after the calf or the human or whatever species is born for the first 24 to 48 hours. The colostrum is a very nutrient antibody immune rich milk that starts to get the immune system of the baby, you know, building right off the bat. What I learned recently about colostrum, which is very interesting, is that bovine colostrum has been studied to be, and it is the most universal absorption like every species can utilize the nutrients in bovine colostrum which is very interesting so if you tried to drink colostrum from another species it may not work for you but they have found that bovine colostrum works for dogs works for other animals works for humans it's quite remarkable so you know but just knowing and i've seen so many dogs thrive on uh, goat milk or cow milk as long as it's raw so and there's even goat milk fasting as maybe some people have heard that a lot of holistic vets, including myself, are now uh, recommending or encouraging in some situations to do goat milk fasting, where that's all the dog consumes for like 30 days, sometimes longer. And as I said, it's completely life sustaining and actually very good at supporting the immune system and, you know, helping the body to shed any chronic inflammation and autoimmune conditions and things like that. So it definitely is very, very nutritional for them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that question, Kat. That's yeah. great. And um, Jana Marie says, I sprinkle liver, liver caps on the food. Hey, so that's for an older, food. yeah, that's, uh, mm -hmm. thank you for um, contributing that. There are some great things. So organ meats are nutrient dense. And so you definitely want to be including those in your pet's diet. Um, if your pet is older, literally, you know, making sure there's some organ meat in the diet. We know there's been studies to show too that organ meats, when anybody consumes them, actually add strength to your body, okay? In Chinese medicine, we call them blood tonics and strengtheners. Uh, so organ meats are great. They are also tasty for the majority of dogs. Obviously, a canine species, that would be one of the primary things they would go for in you know their selection of their diet. And so a lot of pets will be drawn to that and get a lot of um, nutrients out of it. So you can grind stuff or you know use the freeze dried. And there are even companies that make things like our local tiger tail, Raw food company makes liver dust and they bake liver and then they grind it into a tiny little powder and it's like a spice jar and you shake it on the pet's food. So that's another wonderful thing to do, yeah. Um, one more comment I could come up with too is that some older dogs also might like their food pureed or you know really kind of ground down fine. So you can always throw stuff in a little you know, blender and make a little uh, gravy or slurry or something that is a little easier to lap up rather than having to chew. Mm -hmm. Great advice. And I want to welcome everyone who's just come onto the line here with us, many of you joining. And uh, please, you know, if you feel inclined, if you have other dog loving friends, pet having friends, then we would love for you to share this out there. This is the way we spread this information, as I always say, but I think it bears repeating that many people can't access knowledge like this. They don't have a holistic vet to go to, or they don't know these resources. So by you sharing it just on your Facebook page, you never know who it's gonna land into the lives of and be able to help. So we really appreciate you helping us share the good word.
Um, I wanted to ask this question while we're on the topic of food from Miriam. If I want to change my dog's diet, are there tests that I can run to make sure the new diet is working for him? Like blood Ooh, tests? Such a great question. Thank you, Miriam. Um, I, so working for them, there's, there's nothing that is really specific to necessarily say that it's working for them, but I can expand on, you know, that to make it a little bit more broad to say that I really like to, and many holistic vets, but most conventional vets don't do this. I like to do a vitamin and mineral panel on my patients. And it is, it is a small panel. It doesn't show all kinds of nutrients and you can, now there are more tests coming out like hair analysis where you can find out levels of zinc and selenium and things like that, that happen to be, you know, very deficient in most dogs and humans. But I do a blood panel through a specific lab that um, does outside the box testing that most, you know, veterinary labs don't offer. And I standardly run a vitamin D level a magnesium level and a cobalamin, which is vitamin B12 level on my patients. That is one way to decipher if the diet that you're doing is hitting some of those big marks that are so important. And I will tell you so many dogs are vitamin D deficient. In fact, magnesium as well. Eight out of 10 dogs are deficient in both of those. Uh, mm -hmm. And older pets and any pets with GI issues are typically deficient in cobalamin, which is vitamin B12. So if you can have that test done, that would be excellent. And I even provide that test actually for people who live remotely, you know, when I uh, work with people around the country, because we can actually send them a kit for that. Uh, and if they're, so if their veterinarian doesn't have an account with that lab, they can have their, the pet's blood drawn at the local veterinarian and submit the kit. And then we get the results and, you know, it happens very uh, smoothly that way. But that is an excellent thing to do to assess diet. Dr. Debias, which I know um, Amanda has mentioned in our sessions before, is such a great resource as well as a holistic vet uh, to follow. And he is offering a hair analysis test with the minerals and things like that. So that would probably be what I would point you to as well. That would be really easy. I don't think, I think you need a blood test for vitamin D and things like that, but the minerals you can get from hair. So you may wanna check Dr. Debias's site and uh, think about doing that. That would be a great investment. Super interesting. Thank you. Mm -hmm. That's great. Okay, so we're going to switch over to a little different topic here. Um, well, sort of a different topic, still in the realm of food, but specific food. You know, is prescription dog food good for dogs who have specific problems and therefore are guided to eat that food? Tell us a little yes. bit about that. Thank you. I am so glad whoever submitted this question, thank you very much, because this is a phenomenal topic to talk about, is that you know, so many people are concerned when their veterinarian, their, their primary veterinarian is recommending a specific prescription diet for the pet. Is it safe to stray from that? And, you know, how, and people read a lot of people that are that are nutrition conscious are reading these labels going, how can this be such a, a healthy food for my dog with kidney disease or GI problems or whatever, when the ingredients are corn and soy and wheat and, you know, hydrolyze this and that. And so indeed, unfortunately, the, the standard diets that most veterinarians recommend have inappropriate ingredients for dogs. I mean, it's, it's species inappropriate. And so the way I like to describe it to people and, and know, you know, and all due respect for my colleagues, I mean, this is how we're trained. And in studies, they show that these diets work, you know, so you can, if you have inflammation in the dog's gut, so say it's a GI problem, and there's inflammation on the lining of the gut and you feed these specific foods, the inflammation may fall initially. But the thing is, is what is the payoff? When the inflammation in the gut goes down because the protein is hydrolyzed, and so what hydrolyzed protein, a lot of the dogs now with GI issues are being prescribed hydrolyzed protein or HP diets, which means these proteins have been broken down into synthetically into nanoparticles so that the body doesn't recognize them as protein anymore, so the body won't react to it as a food intolerance or you know, an inflammatory issue. And so you know, my take on that as a holistic practitioner is that the body was designed to eat food, and if we have to resort to sort of tricking the body that it's not a protein by hydrolyzing it, then you know, I think it's not the greatest solution. Now, granted, for a short-term solution, if the dog is in the middle of you know, really bad symptomatic pattern, I am okay with anything short term because this diet, those diets sometimes do work very well initially. 
but a year down the line, they start suffering more health problems. A lot of dogs won't eat them. They're not that palatable. And so you end up with a myriad of issues when they're on that chronically, but short term, it can calm things down. Absolutely. So my take on a lot of the, the typical kibble prescription diets is I feel that they're not a bad, especially for the GI situation, they may not be a bad stepping stone, but my goal would always be to graduate beyond that and get to something that's more natural and that's gonna truly support full body health. And there are so many things we can do for calming that GI you know, track down without necessarily having to use hydrolyzed protein, okay? But if dogs come to me and they're on that and they were just in the middle of a disastrous gut and now you know, the pet parents are saying it did work, you know, they're doing well and I'm like, okay, then let's leave it there for the moment. Let's get some good supplements going, some things that are really going to start healing that gut, and then we'll slowly transition away from that diet later. So that's the approach that I take. One of the things I printed out, because this question was turned in ahead of time, which I love, um, is that there are now fresh food companies that are making prescription diets. So many of you may be familiar with a company called Just Food for Dogs. You try and get it into my camera. So just food for dogs, and you can see the bowl, sort of. Um, this is a very limited ingredient diet. This prescription diet shown in the picture is a limited ingredient diet, and the name of the prescription is Balanced Remedy for, for GI, for gastrointestinal. So this would be a fresh food diet that is fully formulated and fully balanced, and actually you know, many very wonderful vets work, for, work with this company. And so this diet would absolutely be, you know, this uh, would qualify for what any veterinarian would recommend for a GI diet. This would be, you know, a perfect option. And so I like to steer people toward this. And fortunately, many conventional veterinarians in my area are also recommending Just Food for Dogs now. And people are seeing the phenomenal results. So again, this diet is very limited ingredient to help the gut calm down. But I wouldn't, you know, my goal would not be to leave them on this forever. Maybe they're on it for two months or three months or, you know, if it has to be longer, six months. But this would be something that I would expect to have them on uh, temporarily. And then we graduate beyond that once we really achieve some healing. So. And Dr. Kangas, maybe you said this, but I believe Just Food for Dogs is available at PetSmart. Is that oh, right? Oh, thank you for, it's Petco. So Petco? thank you for bringing that up. Yeah. So. Um, just Food for Dogs, and there are other companies out there, but the, they really are one of the leading premier because they do prescription diets. There's very few other fresh, there's lots of good fresh food companies, you know, coming out um, and, and already established, but most of them, or I think all of them, do not really do prescription diets yet. Just Food for Dogs, fortunately, teamed up with many veterinarians. They have a toxicologist, nutritionist, dermatologist, several, you know, general practice vets, that have helped formulate and you know uh, work with this company and formulate the diets. So very very credible uh, you know background with all of this. And they luckily they started in um, California, but they have branched out <clears throat> nationally because they formed a partnership with Petco. So now most Petcos you can go in and you can buy just food for dogs. It's it's not part of Petco. Um, business-wise, they're just have kitchens inside Petco, which is nice. They're still their own entity. So the, you know, the intent and the quality and everything is going to stay the same because they are a very passionate, great company. Um, but now they're available through Petco, which makes it much more accessible to people. And I think as most things, you can um, order them online and they can be delivered on ice. And Farmer's Dog, which doesn't do prescription, but Farmer's Dog and Open Farm and Ali Dog and a lot of these other companies that deliver, of course, you know, it's easy to get fresh food delivered these days. So that's a wonderful yeah. thing too. Yeah, and I noticed the cost is going down more and more. They're yeah. offering more, op, you know, bonuses or um, discounts. And, you know, if you buy bulk and those kinds of things, I've noticed yeah. the price has become more and more reasonable, even over the last two years or so. So that's, that's good absolutely. news as well. Yeah, more available to people then. That's great. And I noticed last time I was in Petco, which was a while ago, but there were a lot more natural products in general. They had a whole host of things that I'd never seen, brands that normally were not there. And, and the, on the same conversation, some of the more uh, unnatural brands, I didn't see so much emphasis and spotlight on them. So I think that they're starting to transform. Yeah. And that's, that's really good news for that is, the pet world. 
they realize that the demand is growing and what a beautiful thing. Yeah. Okay, so we have a lot of questions on one similar topic, which is around oral care and chewing. So like dog mouths, <laughs> cat mouths. Okay. Yep. So uh, my brother even asked here at one point <laughs> in his hilarious way that he states things, um, how do we get our little asshole puppy to stop chewing on everything? <laughs> oh, that's he so is funny. a fabulous little puppy. He's my nephew. I love him dearly, but he does chew pretty much everything. And so there's, you know, what can you do to prevent the chewing? And then I just saw another question, like for dogs that don't, you know, don't really like to chew on those kinds of things. Um, how do you keep their healthy gums and okay. prevent you Okay, great. I have a whole, like I could do a whole, I just did a whole hour for Dogs Naturally on this, by the way. And I have a big oh, nice. background in dentistry, which is unique to most general practice veterinarians at all and definitely holistic veterinarians. So I could talk for a while. So you may have to curb me at certain points here, but I'll try and, and stick in the highlights. Uh, and to start off, what I can say, what you should not let your pet chew is anything that is hard enough to break a tooth, okay? There are many um, chew items or chew toys that are marketed for dogs that you will see in the pet stores that are horribly you know, damaging to teeth and very risky. So a lot of the good small specialty pet stores that know better literally will not carry antlers, hooves, nylon bones, all these things because they are so hard they can break your dog's teeth. And it's estimated one in 10 dogs, 10% 10 of dogs have a broken tooth in their mouth. Now, if you had a broken tooth, you would know. I mean, it, it, it's definitely painful. If it breaks through enough that the root canal is exposed, it can get infected. It's very painful. Even if just the enamel is broken and the dentin is exposed, then the teeth are sensitive. So broken teeth are a big issue and they often end up getting infected. So we do wanna avoid damaged teeth to the best of our ability. And so do not provide your dog with anything that's really hard. A good rule of thumb is if you can't bend it with your own hands or dent it with a fingernail, it's hard enough to break your dog's tooth, okay? So as a general rule, when it comes to feeding bones, like people say, well, then what about marrow bones and things like that? I don't see as many dogs break teeth on bones, even though they can be quite hard, but still just understand the risk there. Also, statistically, something that is longer and thinner like a nylon bone or maybe a rib bone or like a you know long leg bone that's really sturdy um, that would be a more likely culprit for the teeth to break big large knuckle bones and things where it's occupying most of their jaw space they usually won't break teeth on and that's just because of the force you know with the mastication muscles coming down if it's occupying most of the mouth they generally don't get enough force to break a tooth but with something long and thin just uh you know out of statistics, it's more likely that they may break a tooth with that. So just keep that in mind. Um, anything that is, you know, again, like I said, softer, more malleable will be a safer item. But then when it comes to chew things, obviously you want to look at the ingredients. There's a lot of raw hides and chew things and, you know, the greenies and <clears throat> many, many other things that have a lot of wheat and gluten and soy and, you know, hydrolyzed this and that. And so you definitely want to look at the label and, you know, try to go for things that are obviously simpler and things that don't have a lot of the highly allergenic things like the soy and the gluten and the wheat and things like that. Um, I did print out a couple of things to show you that I really like for chewing. So I just want to say one thing is that with the greenies, I see so many people that give them every day or even every meal. You know, we board dogs and Ooh, yeah, oftentimes yeah. dogs will come and they want them to get two a day. And I'll Ooh. share with them, you know, that's a large part like, of your dog's diet. I was just going to say that, that is such a great comment because I haven't had people, you know, to, since I don't house them myself, I don't get that sort of take on things. So that's a really good um, contribution is that is a huge part of the diet. And when you look at the ingredients in there, I would say like two a week, you know, not yeah. two a day. Yeah. yeah. So great, great comment. Um, I love the fish skins and, you know, the long fish skins, though they're pretty chewy. Mm -hmm. Honest Kitchen, of course, one of my favorite companies that offers the fish skins and um, other things. I also printed out, this is just an example. I haven't used these myself, but Merrick um, Fresh Kisses, they're shaped well. And the ingredient, there is some pea starch, but other than that, it's all good ingredients and there's coconut oil and there's some essential oils in there that will freshen the breath and things like that. So 
you know, that's a, a nice option. Um, I also like, my doggy has this, a Kong dental stick. Mm -hmm. So this looks like this. I couldn't find, I think it's actually at work. Um, <laughs> everything's backwards. So it actually looks like this. This is an awesome chew item because as most people know, Kong toys are this hard rubber that is mostly indestructible. Some dogs can do it, but most dogs aren't able to, to you know, chew it up and destroy it. It is very, um, but it's very flexible. So it's not going to injure the teeth. This particular one with these grooves on here is going to have all these surfaces that are going to rub on the gums. Because the thing you really want for for dental health is something that's actually going to rub on the gums. You want the gum line, you want to take care of gingivitis. So if it's just rubbing on the enamel of the teeth, maybe they'll have less tartar, but that's really a cosmetic benefit only. It's not doing anything for the health. So you want something that is going to mechanically provide some gentle abrasion on the gums. Okay. And so this is something that really is a great tool to do that. I like to stuff it. Well, you clearly with all these ridges, it also has like a center little lumen or, you know, um, center space in there. So you can stuff the center and you can stuff all those ridges. We have dried anchovies at my practice from a local mm -hmm. raw food company, uh, Soli Raw, that does dried anchovies and they happen to fit in those crevices perfectly. Mm -hmm. So I tend to put the dried anchovies in there, but any little freeze dried treat or air dried treat or something like that, um, you could do something like peanut butter, but it would be a pain to clean you know, out, um, but something like that. The nice thing about this is that, again, it's going to provide that action to literally rub on the gums and a lot of times after the treats are taken out of it, and it takes most dogs a little bit of time to do that, it still kind of smells like the treats. So some dogs, including my dog Sage, will kind of chew on it for a while, even after the treats are gone. So some dogs may chew all the treats and walk away and Rob may be like, okay, that kept my puppy, you know, busy for like two minutes. Now what do I do? But it's definitely a good option. So try that. Um, for Rob's question, boy, that can be tough with puppies because as we know, they're super orally fixated. Um, so as many chew items, you know, whether it's some ropes or these things, um, keeping them busy, exercising them a lot, you know, a lot of trainers will say an ill-behaved puppy is an under-exercised puppy. They're bored. Um, play dates, play groups, because, you know, you watch them rough and tumble with other puppies and the other puppies, they bite each other and like nobody cares, you know, it's like, that's what they do but when they chew on our things or bite us, we care. <laughs> so, you know, getting them acting with their species uh, with as much as you can and obviously recruiting, you know, trainers and behaviorists and stuff to give you some other ideas that I might not be able to give you, but that's an essential, you know, give them as many things and as many different opportunities and um, exercise and stimulation and things like that. You can also hide, like a lot of uh, trainers will advocate for, I wouldn't use kibble of course, but like with air dried foods, or freeze dried foods, throw them out in your yard, throw them around the house, make the puppies hunt for them, make your dogs hunt for them. It gives them something, obviously in the wild evolutionary, their instincts, a good part of their day would have been spent searching for food. And our modern day pets, they get their food, they eat it in five seconds, and then they're like, what do I do for the next 10 hours, you know? <laughs> so they really need some, so, you know, hide their food. You know, some people literally have games where they hide the food and the dog has to go, you know, find it. And so all kinds of fun stuff like that, I would look at. Such a good reminder for many of our dogs, not just puppies, you know, I'm thinking exactly. of my little Benny with the hurt knee, we reduced his weight quite significantly. You're going to be very surprised when you see him next. He's like a little bean pole. <laughs> but boy, is he angry about this food <laughs> reduction. Right. And I think it just made me realize that if I were to hide his food and make it more fun and interactive and more time consuming, maybe exactly. it's the less because literally with a you know, small amount of food in a dish, it's like five seconds, maybe, yeah. you know? Yeah, oh, so that's a great idea. idea. Okay. It makes me think too, when dogs are outside, you know, if, if I hear from someone like you too, I'm sure if their dog's eating a lot of things like dirt and rocks and sticks and everything outside, there may be a, a digestive issue. Sometimes I think when dogs are in general healthy dogs and you're, you feel that they have good stable di GI tract, maybe sometimes they're doing that because they like to forage and they want to find that acorn or they want to find that little piece of, I don't know, rodent poop or yep. whatever yep. it is that they're searching. Exactly. For. Or they're bored because, you know, mm -hmm. it's definitely a natural instinctive of dogs to chew. Because again, you know, in the wild, if they're killing a prey and, you know, they've got the time and they don't have to run off to something else, they're going to sit there and chew on those bones and, you know, 
have a nice, you know, meal over what they have accomplished. And, and that's something that gives them um, those natural instincts being satisfied. So yeah, chewing on sticks and things like that is just that natural instinct and maybe some boredom too. Interesting. Okay, so now moving on to our next topic that is asked in several different ways. It's around fleas and ticks and prevention. Now I do want to just say, I'm going to hide that real quick, is I do want to say that about what, three months ago now, Dr. Kingis did a uh, Sama Saturday focused solely on that. And she gave a ton of information. So you can just go to our YouTube page. That's probably the easiest location to find. You know, you can find the um, playlist of all of the Sama Saturdays and you'll see dental care on there from, again, just a few months ago. I, I just realized, and I'm sorry, because I'm gonna back up to dental, that somebody did ask what to do if your pet won't chew on things. And I didn't even get mm -hmm. to that topic. So mm -hmm. yeah, we can move in or we could round back to dental. Yeah, go ahead and share it now. Okay, so for pets that won't chew on any of the chew items, by the way, that we talked about, uh, there are things that you can use in the mouth to help the gums, and there are numerous options. I oftentimes, well, clearly brushing the teeth. If your pet will allow you to brush the teeth, that's really the best thing, again, with mechanical abrasion of just wiping away the plaque, which is bacteria in a biofilm. And biofilms are very strong, this you know layer or film of bacteria. So wiping away is the best thing to do. And that's why we all brush our teeth, of course. So brushing teeth is the best. If your dog won't let you do that, there's still lots of things that you can do. Uh, to put on the gums and coconut oil can be put directly on the gums or the toothbrush. There are essential oil blends like Animal EO, Dr. Melissa Shelton's line has a formula called Dog Breath. Um, the Animal Essentials Company, which I uh, like so much, they have something called Healthy Gums and there's going to be all kinds of things in there like fennel and there might be peppermint and you know other herbs and uh, you know plant uh, ingredients that are going to help to not only freshen the breath, but provide natural antimicrobial benefit and natural anti-inflammatory benefit from the gums or for the gums. And then um, there's also a new product out, which I really like that I put the bag right here too, that's called Teeth. And I've just started carrying this in my practice. And interestingly, the creator of this product is a microbiologist. She's a doctor, but not a veterinarian, Dr. Emily Sign. And she actually reached out to me because she saw one of my articles in a veterinary journal about promoting good dentistry and natural and proactive you know, care for the mouth. And I talk about the microbiome in the mouth and actually applying, and there's a good topic that I forgot to mention, is applying probiotics onto the gums, especially right before bed when it just sits there because good bacteria will help to crowd out the bad bacteria, the pathogenic bacteria that you know the gingivitis is, is being caused by. So anyway, this product is designed to put in your pet's drinking water. So talk about easy, and there's virtually no flavor. I've tasted this, and um, humans can take it too, and they, she actually has a human product that's made into a little lozenge that you suck on, and it dissolves in your mouth. And there's only natural ingredients in this product, and what it does is pathogenic bacteria that are creating gingivitis and plaque they feed on sugar. So of course, anybody who eats more sugar is gonna have more dental disease. Dogs that eat more carbohydrates, which is the standard kibble, are generally going to have worse dental disease than dogs that eat you know, either a raw diet or a diet that's very low in carbohydrates. Same thing with people uh, as certainly a general trend. So this product has a molecule in it that mimics sugar, but it's not sugar. It's very attractive to the pathogenic bacteria. They bind to it and they'd starve. How cool is that? And then I know, isn't this neat? I just like learned I about it. Yep, exactly. And this microbiologist is really phenomenal. And she's got all kinds of studies in you know humans and doggies. And so the other ingredients in there, there's some L-arginine and some vitamin B6. She said those are synergistically working to um, support the good bacteria. So you get a you know increase of healthy microbiome, oral microbiome bacteria and you get the pathogenic bacteria dying and starving. So you have this shift of healthy microbiome, inflammation falls, gingivitis you know, clears up, and tremendous benefits for both animals and humans, by the way. So it's Teeth for Dogs. The website is actually teethhealth.com. And for humans, if you're interested in this for yourself, I got some for myself, um, and they're tasty. They have a mint and an orange lozenge version. 
Um, it's dailydentalcares.com for the human product. So that is a lovely one for anybody who won't let you get their dogs that just like people are like, I cannot go into their mouth with anything. And so I would do this for anybody, but certainly those dogs look at teeth. So, mm -hmm. sorry. Mary, I, that's what we were talking about there. Mary just asked, what, what are we referring to? There you go. Yeah, yeah teeth. Okay, yeah, good. these guys. Yep. So just to remind you, that's that product. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. And you just mix up, I got it for my dogs too, and you just mix up like a big gallon of it. You put, you know, whatever their dosage is, a teaspoon. It's literally one, one scoop. The scoop, the scoop is tiny, and yeah, it's one it's scoop good. in the drinking, you know, in the water dish. Mm -hmm. And it's very, very safe. So, I mean, they could consume 10 times the amount, you know, per day, and it's completely safe. So if you have multiple dogs, good I job. would either put it in multiple dishes so that everybody's getting enough, or um, if you have to fill your water bowl, you know, two or three times a day, you could put a scoop in at least, you know, in each bowl or a couple times or whatever. So very, very safe. And it's nice for all the doggies in the household to get it. Mm -hmm. Great. Okay. So now we will come to our last topic generally because we have several different questions that ask from different angles. So let me find... Um, where we were here with Trish said, fleas, we have an outdoor, older outdoor cat that loves to lay in the bushes and is bringing in so many fleas that the poor dogs are now dealing with it too. We're using diatomaceous earth on the carpet and a lot of laundering, but we still keep finding them. Any recommended supplements to help deter them? And how bad, this is another uh, participant asked this too, Capstar, how bad is Capstar to use? Um, do you suggest it? Yeah, that's, you know, I, I think that Capstar is, is pretty safe. I think it's a lot safer than a lot of the other flea medications, but I have to admit, I haven't personally used it in many years. But, you know, the, the downside of Capstar, so a lot of veterinarians have sort of moved away from using this because the downside of Capstar is it only kills the fleas that are on them at that moment. It has almost no residual action. Now, if you want to stay away from these long-term chemicals, it still has purpose. So I'm not saying, you know, not to use it, but just realize the limitations of it. Unfortunately, you are only going to have like that 24 hour window of killing the fleas. And if there's obviously fleas in the environment, the home or wherever, um, they can jump right back on the next day. And, you know, so you'd have to give Capstar very, so it's generally, best used in a circumstance of where you have a pet that is loaded with fleas and you just need to get them off. Like that pet's just suffering and you know, whatever. But when you are using Capstar, you always have to work on the environment um, because otherwise you'll have the problem right back. So, and again, as we talked in our full length, you know, discussion, obviously, you know, goes without saying a, a very healthy diet. Again, things that are going to support the immune system, um, things that are species appropriate, low in carbohydrate, you know, fresh foods, all those kinds of things are going to make the pet uh, more resilient to parasites in the first place. So less likely to have as heavy of a flea infestation if the, you know, body, the whole body is healthy. But that being said, depending on the environment that you're in and the season, you can still have battles even with pets that eat very, very healthy diets. So again, I'm always of the mindset, choose your battles, use as many uh, holistic or natural tools as you can and be diligent. Don't expect that you're going to be able to use them once or twice and the problem's going to be solved. It's not like these powerful chemicals where you can apply it once a month and forget about it for a month with diatomaceous earth and with, you know, essential oil things. Um, you know, you're just going to have to be very, very diligent. The wonder side products are safe for cats. Um, and they generally work very well. Um, there might be, you know, certain individuals that really don't like essential oils, but they are safe. Okay. So they're even safe for kittens. Uh, so if that's something you haven't employed yet, I would keep up the diatomaceous earth because I think it's very, you know, worthy. But if that's not doing it by itself, uh, I would recruit some other options. Dr. Melissa Shelton at animaleo.info. EO stands for essential oils. Animaleo.info. Dr. Melissa Shelton is a wonderful resource. Her company uh, makes many different essential oils that are specifically tailored and blended for pets. And so you can count on the safety of her products. And she does have uh, flea and tick products too that she even has what she calls a flea bomb. Get everybody out of the house, set off the diffusers and literally just like, you know, do an essential oil bomb in the house. That's pretty cool. So um, you may want to look at that too. If it comes down to you've tried everything, then you may want to just use a conventional product, like hopefully once, 
you know, sometimes you can just use it once and it'll last for a month and then you're done, you know, and then you, it gives you time to get the environment cleaned out. Maybe the season changes a little bit or whatnot, but I'm just of the, the mindset, obviously, to minimize as many chemicals as you can, but fleas are no picnic for anybody. And that can cause a lot of health diseases too. And so if you're employing all these means, if you have to turn to something conventional, um, you know, just try and minimize as much as you can. Stretch it out. You know, you've always taught me that is like you can stretch some of these out a little further. Not than, you know, use them. Yeah, like, thirty days. You don't have to set your timer for that. Just go on need. Yeah, That's great. Okay, I am squeezing in one last question because this is a good one and something that I've been asked a lot is, can you please inform us on using activated charcoal for detox? Uh, well. You know what's funny about that is I I actually really don't use activated charcoal for detox. So I can't give you a whole lot of clinical experience on dosing and other things. There are many other things though that I do use for detox. So I could certainly get you a dose and Amanda can, you know, post it later and I can get you a protocol, but I personally actually don't employ that tool in my toolbox. So not one that I can speak to really directly. Um, but there are a lot of other things that I do use for detox and there are clay products like betonite clay, Montemorolite clay, that same company I showed you with the amino B plex earlier when we were talking about the B12, um, the RX vitamins company, they make a product called RX clay there is, which comes in a powder. There's another company called platinum performance that makes a capsule form called bio sponge. And those are both clays that will absorb toxins and bring them out of the bowel. They're, you know, they're bowel detoxes really specifically. But many humans, if you've done a detox program for yourself, you may remember that a lot of times betonite clay is recommended. You can even soak in it, you can put it in a bath, but you can certainly take it orally. It's very safe. It could be taken every day for long term, or it could be used as needed. So it, if any dog gets diarrhea or stool problems, clay is one of the things I really like to use because it's very proactive. You know, if you take Emodium or you know something else that stops diarrhea. It's just stopping it up, but it's not It's not you know solving the problem or addressing the problem that caused the diarrhea in the first place If the body's gonna react to something it's because you ingested or your dog ingested something that the body's like nope Don't want this. Let's get this out. You know mm -hmm. diarrhea so clay will actually help to naturally solidify the stools so if your dog, you know nobody wants to have the messes of diarrhea, that's unpleasant for everybody. It will help to firm up the stools quickly, but proactively is a bowel detox at the same time. So that's gonna bring out toxins. And so it's a much more proactive thing than do doing most anti-diarrheal type medications. Um, another thing that I really love to use for detox, for systemic, is zeolites. And zeolite is a very special clay that comes from the volcan like a volcanic ash layer of the earth. Uh, a, a, there's many types of zeolites that are all recognized as being powerful and safe detoxifiers for animals and people. But there is a very specific type of zeolite that is known to be the most therapeutic form of zeolite, and it's called clinoptolite, a mouthful. So zeolite's easier to say, but clinoptolite is actually sold by Glacier Peak uh, Holistics Company, and I love their product line too. And so that's the product that I carry. Uh, their clinoptolite, they actually blend it with a kelp and another product they call Super Cleanse. Okay. Clinoptolite or zeolites have a host of benefits and they literally are systemic detoxifiers. And they've been shown in studies of mice and dogs and humans. They will pull lead out of the brain. They will pull mercury out of the body, arsenic. I mean, heavy metals. This stuff is awesome. So that's what I have been using as of late. And so you can see why I just haven't used activated charcoal as much because I have all these other tools that are that are easy at my fingertips, sold for pets, dosing right on there. So it's easy for me to dispense it for people. So, um, but clinoptolite is a clay again, or zeolites that has no flavor. Sometimes you can find them in liquid form formats, but most of the time they're powdered. Um, they are used widely for farm animals. Uh, also they're fed to pigs, cows, chickens, because those guys have so much contamination in their environment. So it's approved for animal feed. It's very safe. Um, and it can help control diarrhea as well as GI issues. It's got anti-inflammatory uh, properties for the gut and it's a fantastic detoxifier systemically. It's one of the things that I like to give after vaccinations because as we know, most vaccines have adjuvants in them, which are heavy metals like aluminum and mercury. So when people say, what do I do after a vaccine? Take a homeopathic detox 
and take some clonoptolite or some zeolite. That'll help remove some of those um, bad agents in the vaccines too. Mm -hmm. And that's exactly what Mary was just writing that she was asking about detoxing puppy vaccines. So yeah, answer so puppy, question. yeah. So homeopathy for puppy vaccines is generally going to be Thuja, T H U J A. Um, generally a 30 C, but you know you could really use any potency, and and that would work. Uh, Thuja could be used for three to five days after. And there's actually there's a company called Adored Beast that makes a product that's in a liquid little spray. You could just spray it. It's homeopathy, and it's called anti-vaccinosis. But it is Thuja and Silicea in there. Okay, but Thuja you can just use standardly by itself for puppy vaccines. For a rabies vaccine regarding homeopathy, you want to use a formula called Listen. Okay, um, so no matter what the vaccine is, I always do a homeopathy, but I also like to use the zeolite or the clonoptolite. That'd be good. Oh my gosh, can you see why we're so crazy about you? I mean, we can't help ourselves. It's just so much good information and it's so diverse and yet so yeah. applicable and so specific and it's the common ailments and challenges that we're all facing. So that's extremely helpful. You know what, if we have more time, there was one question that was turned in ahead of time and I have a bunch of stuff to give if, if we have time or we can table it to another discussion. Yeah, maybe we're just getting to the end of our time here. If you want to, um, what, what's the topic? What is so the it was one that said best natural supplements or foods for intestinal flare-ups that cause pain. Mm. So yeah, and that was asked a couple times. So go ahead. Let's okay. do it. So because I do have some stuff here, but again, you know, we meet yeah, a lot, no. so we could always do it in the future. Okay, so many of you have probably seen me talk about uh, gastrointestinal stuff and we had a whole discussion a few times back on pain and i talked about how gastrointestinal pain is definitely something to be considering when your pet is acting depressed or painful or things like that because gi pain uh, is you know a relatively common thing in pets so again i love the animal essentials line so i wanted to speak to the power of colon rescue okay colon rescue as you can see is a liquid formula it is very palatable. Amanda's familiar with this formula too. Um, I've actually taken this formula. It's marketed for pets, but it's completely safe for humans. It's vegetable glycerin based actually from coconut oil. Uh, and the ingredients in here are slippery elm, marshmallow root, licorice root, and plantain leaf. Slippery elm and all of the ingredients in here, licorice too, very healing for the gut, can calm inflammation, soothe the gut lining, and promote healing. So if the gut is cramping, if the gut is you know, annoyed um, or irritated, colon rescue is literally a rescue. This stuff is like magic. I mean, I literally, I wish I would have created this formula because this is literally my all time favorite formula herbal and it flies off our shelf. Like we can't even keep this stuff in stock. And most of the um, holistic like pet stores that I am familiar with, they all carry this too. Okay, they know how good that works too. Um, Animal Essentials also makes daily digestion and I, I take this one too. Um, and I put it in my drinking water uh, generally in the morning, but it's got peppermint, ginger root, fennel, and chamomile, okay? And those are all soothing and calming. And fennel has been, I was actually looking in, um, many of you know, I love Greg Tilford, herbalist behind the Animal Essentials line. He has his Herbs for Pets book, which is an excellent resource. And I was looking up fennel and some of these ingredients and what they do. Fennel is known to relieve gastric discomfort. So that is cool. And he even describes how you could make your own fennel tea. So maybe Amanda could post this, but literally a teaspoon of dried fennel seeds in eight ounces of boiled water, steep it until it's cool and feed two to four tablespoons to your dog per 20 pounds. Or if they won't eat it that way, you can add it to their drinking water. Okay. And so that literally can, uh, you know, uh, calm stomach discomfort, which is really cool. He also talks about dill, so we can put that up there, but a tablespoon of dill in eight ounces of water and, and um, boiling that and steeping it as a tea and also doing very similar feeding like two to four tablespoons. So that can also calm indigestion and stomach pain and things like that. So, but again, an easy way to do it is just a glycerin tincture then you don't have to do the tea thing. But if you're not, you know, if you're international and you don't have access to this or, you know, you want to do it yourself, you can literally make teas, herbal teas for dogs that will help calm the gut as well. So pretty cool stuff. And then one more comment actually is, again, Amanda and I love Honest Kitchen. And Honest Kitchen's Perfect Form is another one of my all-time favorite supplements. Um, Perfect Form has Slippery Elm, which I mentioned. It's got fennel, papaya, and... Um, 
fibers like pumpkin and pectin and things like that. So all good things for the gut. It's in a powdered form. That stuff's like magic too. And it's called digestive aid, but perfect form because it helps keep poops in perfect form. But again, very calming and soothing and healing to the gut. So another good one to know about. Easily accessible online as well and at our natural pet food markets. They mm -hmm. almost always yep. have that. So thank you for squeaking that yeah. in because I thought that was a good one. So. Yeah, that is such a good one. And um, it just reminds me too with the teas, you know, from the Ayurvedic world, of course, that's my area of expertise. And so when we talk about fennel tea, it reminds me for human beings, as well as animals, for vata, it's because they suffer from gas and bloating and airiness and the fennel tea really helps to calm and relieve that gas. Right. And for pitta, fennel tea is really good because it's cooling. So it re relieves the inflammation and the heat, like you said. And then for kapha, fennel tea is very good because it's invigorating and just any spice really kind of promotes digestion and gets things moving where sometimes it's sluggish and kapha. So it's a very tridoshic. I was just going to say what a beautifully balanced herb, you know, yeah. and as I, yeah. you know, discomfort and one of the other things that's really written up on it is bloating and distension and gassiness. Mm -hmm. So, and even nausea. So, yeah. yeah. So it's wonderful that from the Ayurvedic, you know, perspective, it's so versatile as well. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Very cool. Ooh. All right, friends. Well, you have received tons of information here. I hope you took some notes. <laughs> if not, no worries, because we will have this recording up on our YouTube page and our Facebook page, as always, re repost afterwards for any uh, reviews or previews that you'd like to share or refresh yourself with. It's important that I also share with you because I'm sure when you hear from Dr. Kangas, you want to work with her more and one-to-one -one individualized with your animals. So that is very available to you. She does telemedicine, so you don't necessarily have to be in the San Diego area. She can work with you from multiple locations and all online via Zoom. So you can contact her and get on her books through her website, intovetcare, I-N-T-V-E-T-C-A-R-E.com. You see it there at the bottom of the screen. And you can also um, access, you know, we have her phone number listed there online. You can call into the office and get booked as well. So um, I highly encourage that phenomenal veterinarian. Obviously, I also work one-on-one, -on -one, kind of more from the lifestyle, bringing in the human behavior and the dog behaviors, being able to bring forth much of what we've talked about today. So you can find out more information about that at samadog.com with my well-being consultations is what I call them. And we are so grateful for you being here, for spreading the word, for asking such awesome questions that gave us this fantastic, rich conversation. So thank you, Dr. Kangas, yet again for all your love and for being here and your time. My pleasure. Thank you so much. And I agreed. I really appreciate everybody that uh, joined us today and all the interest and such great discussions. It makes it more fun and interactive and really um, elevates all of our learning at the same time. So thank you for contributing, everybody. Sure does. All right. Goodbye for now, everyone. We will see you next time. Namaste. Bye -bye. Namaste.